<laughs> I have not now started recording the meeting. Oh, good. After the singing, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> After all, Gloria played, paid for. So just to let you guys know, we are going to record. Um, and I want to say thank you to everybody who's on the call today. Um, thanks for joining us at our first uh, virtual name, Northwest Aquatic and Marine Educator Speaker Series. Woody and I, my name is Jovanina. If you don't know me, I'm just going to practice my introduction. <laughs> my name is Jovanina. This is Woody. We're co uh, directors. directors for Washington Name. And um, if you would like to present at one of these um, presentations or talks, we want to do these on a Monday once a month until further notice just to gather name members and share what we've learned and what we're working on. Um, so you can email me jovanina h2o at gmail.com if you want to give a talk. But thanks so much for being here. Um, not too many of us on the call tonight, but please couple tips, do make sure that you keep yourself on mute while the presenters are presenting so that we don't get a lot of background noise. If we do hear you um, not on mute, we have the power to mute you. So you may find yourself being muted if we <laughs> need to. Um, also, if you have questions throughout the talk, you can put them into the chat box and Woody is going to moderate the talk tonight. So. Um, Woody will be watching the chat box and will bring up questions throughout the talk as Bill's, if, if he feels it's relevant to what Bill is talking about. Um, and then we'll also have time after the talk for some more questions if you're interested or want to stick around and ask more questions afterwards. All right, so we got a couple more people who have joined us now. We're just going through a few tips to keep your self on mute as we get started. Um, and this presentation is being recorded as well. I just wanna let everybody know that. So to get us started, uh, Fawn Custard, our, Custard. Is, sorry, Custer is going to start us out tonight with a fun holiday activity. <laughs> she is a longtime Oregon name member She's the head of our scholarship and mini grant uh, committees. So if you need a mini grant to offer a program to any of your schools and you have questions, talk to Fawn. If you need a scholarship to come to a name event or a conference and you have questions, talk to Fawn. She also is the Coast Watch Citizen Science trainer. Um, and she'll start us out tonight. Next after Fawn will be Bill, um, Hans Shoemaker. Bill has been our National Marine Educators Association representative for many, many years and been on the board for many years. And he works for Oregon State University um, used or used to. <laughs> Still does, but. <laughs> and he's also the Sea Grant uh, Chief Scientist. So, um, Bill will be giving us a talk this evening on his research on axial seamounts. But Fawn, I'm going to pass it over to you first to start us out. Thank you, everybody. Oh, hold on a second. Bill, oh, okay. Bill is the, say that again. He's the Sea Grant Chief Scientist. Is that right? Oregon. That's what I saw on your. Okay, you're still muted. You got to unmute, Bill. You're muted, Bill. Explain. Yeah, I, I, I used to be, but I retired last June. And so I'm not, I haven't been that since then. I still have a, a courtesy appointment with fisheries and wildlife. So I'm still with OSU, but um, I'm not the Oregon Sea Grant uh, chief scientist anymore. Oh, okay. Oh, you're Oregon. I thought you were promoted to the head overall. That's cool. Me. Great. You, you could be, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I was also going to say, um, just a plug for Woody and I, we're going to give the next presentation next month on January 11th. And it'll be about our kayaking trip this past summer with Sailor Sue. Excellent. Okay. Fawn, do you want to share your screen and start us out? 
Okay. So yeah. on this one, everybody can unmute um, and you can call out the answer. Now I have to give credit to my daughter, Narissa, who is actually with her, uh, the, her company, Grandma. she's working remotely. And so they're having to come up with, you know, she was coming up with different activities for the holiday also. So she came up with this. It's a holiday word scramble. And so when you get the word, then, um, you know, holler out the answer. And, um, you know, it's just for, yay. I, I'm, I might send you something out of the bin I have downstairs with name stuff, just for the fun of it. So prizes, but as it is right now, I see that, you know, I have two people who have joined in with the holiday spirit and actually got backgrounds for the holiday. I think for January, um, it'd be nice if you had backgrounds that were for, you know, the snow in January or the new year or something like that. So, you know, so we can make it a little more festive and I'll come up with some kind of fun thing to kick that off to. I'll think, actually I won't, Narissa will, cause she's the one who, <laughs> anyway. All right, so sharing my screen. All right, so here we have our holiday right. word scramble game on. Like I said, I have to give Narissa kudos for this. All righty, let's see. Well, I thought pushing that arrow would work, but maybe not. So I have to do it this way. Rudolph. Yeah. Rudolph. Yeah, who was that? Mary. Mary, way to go. Good point for you. All right. <laughs> Ignore. <laughs> <laughs> Icelandic word scramble or Dutch donor no no oh. um igloo five four three garland nice yeah. Mary who oh. who that garland Mary Mary yeah. Yeah. sorry <laughs> yeah. is this the right Hanukkah 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 yeah. Hanukkah. 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 Uh, Margie got that? Margie yeah, the Canadians are doing well. The Canadians are doing all right. Mr. Toe. Um <laughs> Two ends. It's not minestrone. <laughs> <laughs> no, not minestrone. Huh. Five, four, three, two. Oh, I know. I know. I didn't get that one either. Just no. say Yes. You picked out a tough one. We'll have I'll have to let her know. Snowman. Yay! Wow, good. Nice. Who was that? Amy. Oh, Amy. 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 Yay! Let's say hi. Eggnog. <laughs> Way to go, Bill. <laughs> No, that was Terry. She's she's been coaching me in the back here. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Where's the rum? <laughs> I don't know, but if you guys get to the grocery store, there are these cute little drinks out that are in little balls. <laughs> oh, oh my gosh. Best things ever. Just mm. Poinsettia. Yay! Oh, way to go. Poinsettia, nice. Was that Margie? No, I can't give I can't. another Canadian though. <laughs> <laughs> hey. Feliz Navidad. Feliz Navidad. Yeah. Really? Hi. What? No, there's no. Oh, no, wait. You're right. <laughs> oh dear. No. Is it? Are they, okay. Uh, that one got me too. That's the first thing I said. Wait a minute, no F. Mm. 
Nativity? No. No, it isn't. It, it, Nativity Cradle. Oh, we should have got that. Oh my God. Oh, I can't believe it. We have five. <laughs> Last one. <laughs> Narcotics. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Pizzelle. Uh, <laughs> Run scoping. What? <laughs> it's a sea creature for sure. It's a type of a fish. It's a cotton, so some sort of fish, yeah. Decorational? De 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 decorations. Decorations. Oh. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'll stop sharing now. Oh, great job, Fawn. Thank you. Well, Thank you, Narissa. We're in Canada, definitely one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you, Fawn. That was awesome. Um, Bill, are you ready? I am. What do you want me to do first? Share uh, your screen. Yeah. And. Let's see. Yeah. Okay. Now I have it, but I missed it. I Take us in deep, 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 Bill. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I um, just a minute. I just need to go backwards once. I didn't share my screen before I turned it on. So in show. Um. Oh, great. Now we rehearsed this right before you got on and, and now I'm sitting here not being able to do it again. Um, okay, I'm back there, hit share screen, go to, share, oh crap. Hmm. Yep. Well, it's giving me a different menu than it had before. Oh, yeah. are you on advanced or basic? Or? That's what it was. It was flipped over to advanced. I'll go back. I mean, flipped over to basic, but now yeah. it won't let me. Advanced, to yeah. go to advanced, yeah. Yeah, but now I'm clicking on advanced and it's just flashing at me, which is weird. Oh, don't look. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All yeah. right. All righty. That's it. Now I need to go to tools not tools slide slideshow slide yeah yeah you might have to move the little you yeah i gotta move the box out of the way because it's right on top of uh presenter view yeah this we love ah, awesome. zoom is so wonderful all right now can everyone see the first slide monitoring axial seamount research techniques from 1500 meters below the surface yes can you all see that yes mm -hmm. okay So I, I went out on the um, RV Thompson. I need to kind of close you guys down though. How do I get rid of you? You're covering up my, oh, I don't just drag you down. No Husky um, before, he, before he cuts us off. Yay, University of Washington. Absolutely, yeah. Um, I thought I'd put that in there part, partly because this was the first vessel I ever went to sea on for research. I went out in 1993 out to Axial doing similar stuff, basically looking at instrumentation that was out there to that's used for helping to predict um, when the Axial Seamount will rupt. Okay, now we go over to here. Um, this was the only good weather we had the entire time. I was gone for three weeks. Um, functionally, um, while we were out there was during the firestorm. And because of the firestorm and because of the rough weather, we, had, we couldn't collect data for about five of those days that we were out there. But I thought you'd like to enjoy us leaving the uh, Yaquina Bay. Um, we run this one at the same time. Um, 
one of the things that it's, I mentioned over here, um, ocean, the, the Ocean Observatory Initiative began in 2004 to provide real-time measurement from selected nodes. So now we don't just do research from the ship, we're able to get real-time information from the OOI um, uh, node that's out there on Axial. This is, a, this is a bad map, but basically I wanted just to show you, can you see my mouse going across? I just wanted to show you um, partly about how, that, how far off, we're about 260 miles offshore. Um, basically we have this cable now that comes in that allows us to, to gather a variety of information um, from the different nodes. We can actually change the instrumentation that's on the nodes at future dates as well. Just some background information about axial seamount. Um, this is uh, a, this is the caldera here in the middle, and this is where we're, we're basically doing most of our research. So, um, just to, you, as you can read from the eruptive history, this is in fact the most active um, volcano we have in the Northwest. Um, it just in the last three, uh, has erupted three times in, since 1998. It's now predicted that it probably will. Um, erupt sometimes, sometime between uh, 23 and 25. Um, there's gonna be a couple, I'm gonna go through a bunch of different kinds of equipment that we have on there. Um, the, part of, part of uh, the task that I had was to be in the control panel, uh, excuse me, the control room of the Jason. The, the Jason is this ROV, which is connected by this cable, which allows us not only to see things from a lot of different places, but also it has manipulator arms and has baskets so we can collect stuff. So we can actually deploy things from the Thompson, um, act, put them where we want to put them, you know, right there on the caldera, and then uh, release the things that we've been um, collecting data from before. So the other type of research instruments that we have here are called autonomous, meaning they're gathering information and they're holding that information until we actually go back out there and collect them. Jason is, um, is deployed from the ship. So this is the crane that came with Jason that you see on the left side. Um, and if you look on the right hand side, down below, you can see the thrusters. So the thrusters are basically how they're able to move around on that tether. Now, one of the key things about this is that you want to have that cable at the right angle. If the, if the cable is too acute or too obtuse, um, it actually, um, it, you could have, you could damage the cable. During one of our, our, our deployments, the cable went underneath the ship. So the cable was rubbing against the hull of the ship. As you can imagine, there were a lot of very nervous people in this control room when that had happened. This is what the control van looks like. It's, it looks really busy because it has all those screens on it. And the screens basically are, are you know, showing us what we have on the cameras, both on the Jason and also um, the cameras we have on the ship. So another one of the things that I learned how to do was to select which screen to use, depending on what was the most interesting thing. My chime, we're at seven o'clock, I guess. Um, the three screens that are in the very front are, are, are where um, I, I sat behind those screens, but the people that came over from Woods Toll, there were three of, three of them on each team, there were two teams, and they sat in front of me, uh, the navigator, the pilot, and the other person um, to um, uh, basically go where we wanted to go. So the control team, um, as I said, that, I, oh, the other person is the navigator, the pilot, the engineer, and the navigator. So. In my role as a logger, I was responsible for the three computer screens that are at the bottom, were at the bottom of this image. Um, events, uh, one of the things that I did mostly was logging up events. In other words, as we would see something, I could write in text or there were some drop down menus. And this way, because we were doing this continuously, this way you can do a very rapid sort. If you're looking for something specific, you're able to find it very quickly. Um, it's also, uh, basically they're digitally ca ca uh, captured um, and then it's categorized with a timestamp and then with the with me putting in a title or something about it allows us to do it. It allows us to find the stuff that we've been looking at. We also, um, the, the middle screen is for the, the science navigator. That's, that's the map 
that's basically the, the map part. And, and what, what I would do there is superimpose the ship. You, you have different scales. And so I'd want to get a, a big scale when we're moving, but when we're coming in close, I would shrink down the map. And then the chief scientist who was um, Bill Chadwick, he would sit over to my left and he would basically tell me what to do because I really didn't know what I was doing. Um, this is just giving you a little close up of the multiple angles that these cameras can pick up. You can look and look very carefully. You can see some of those um, screens are essential to the uh, pilot because he's trying or she's trying to uh, either deploy something or recover something. And it's, you know, um, kilometers underneath us. And so it's basically having different camera angles gives you that three dimensional uh, ability to be able to, uh, to actually capture the things that you want to capture or at least the things you want to go, uh, want to uh, look at. Um, the basket is in the front. Uh, that's on the left picture and the ma manipulator arms are on the right hand side. So the, the JSON was really the, one of the best use instruments to use there. I didn't tell you any of this part, but this is kind of interesting. You know, before we left, um, I had to be quarantined. We all had to be quarantined for a couple of weeks. We had our COVID test first, then we were in quarantine, and then we'd have another COVID test, and then we go on board. But then once we were on board, um, we, we basically were under quarantine. We, um, when you go to mess, you um, could only have two people sitting at a table at a time. You had to wash your hands and wear your mask when you were at mess. When we're down in the science center, um, we didn't, we weren't masked up, but we could practice social distancing for the most part. Inside of that closed control panel uh, uh, van, it was highly ventilated and it was filtered. So um, they were able to, to very safely um, put uh, the group from Hui from the um, East Coast. They came over with all this equipment, uh, the Jason and, and also the, cent the Century, which I'm going to show you next. Um, and then two teams. So the whole science crew, we outnumbered the, the crew itself because um, there was a large group of people working with the AUV Century and a large group of people working with the Jason basket and manipulator arms. Recognize that this costs a lot of money. So what we end up having to do is, you know, 24 seven. So we have, we have um, different shifts. So you always have to have multiple people doing your same role. So for example, my, my shift was really a good one. Um, it was from 8, 8, 8 to 12. So I was 8 a.m. to noon, and then I was 8 p.m. to midnight. Um, and that way we were able to, you know, keep Jason and then the Century um, deployed the entire time. This is the Century, the, the, the yellow thing you see on the, on the right, you can see the little fins that are sticking out there. Um, once again, this is not a, a remotely operated vehicle. This is an autonomous vehicle, which means that it literally is programmed and it sends its information back to the surface, which is through another vehicle, which I'll show you later. But the, the idea here is the Sentry isn't as flexible as the Jason. It can do a lot of stuff for a long time, but all the controllers are, 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 are basically programmed into the, into the Sentry. And then the people who are living or who are, are on the ship with us are the ones who are, are manipulating or changing the programs. And I'll explain to you how that works. But this is also one which didn't have that crane like you saw uh, for the Jason. So when we deployed it, um, the first time we deployed it, in fact, um, as they were recovering it, it pounded into the ship in two places and it broke off those fins. That's why I pointed out the fins to you. But they designed the fins so they break away. So basically the joint that attaches the, the fins to the uh, AUV could be replaced and that's what they ended up having to do. So they, they uh, recovered it, they damaged that with the damage to these wings, um, but they are you know, we were able to keep it in production, which is really cool. It was back online within 36 hours. So that third component that I was telling you about is called the wave glider. And this gets back to the idea that because the AUU Century is not directly cabled to the Thompson, it requires this floating pl platform. It, the wave glider basically receives the Century's data acoustically through the seawater and then communicates with the ship with U, um, UHF through an Iridium satellite phone. Once the wave glider is deployed, it has louvers that extend seven meters below for added stability. 
So the, the, the key take home point here is that we couldn't really communicate with the century directly because we're not using acoustics, we're using electromagnetic waves. So we had to have the wave glider on the surface close to the century, and then we communicate to the wave glider, the wave glider would communicate to the century and then vice versa. They would, um, you know, as they collect, as, as information comes in, they send it to the wave glider and then the wave glider sends it to the people that are on the, on the uh, um, Thompson. Now, this is one where I don't know what to tell you because uh, we had several uh, younger people along board that, that added this emoji for the century. Now, pay attention to the right screen and I don't know what this means. So if anybody really knows what this means, I'd be interested in knowing, but it, they spent the day work, the younger people spent the day working on it, putting it on there, gave it a real character, but I don't know what it actually refers to. I think it has something to do with some sort of uh, shrug uh, kind of emotion, but I don't know. Does anybody have an idea? Can you see the emoji, the, the black and white thing that's right here? Orion said it's pretty, she's pretty sure it's an, an anime eye that they put on there because she does art that way. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, I have no idea. But I mean, I, I'd asked and I'd forgotten what they told me. So they, they had an idea, I guess. The other part of my job, which was pretty much 50% um, of my time, had more to do with the CTD deployment. Now, in this case, um, I've done the, the, this conductivity, temperature, and, and density, which is, which is what the instruments below on the, on the CTD uh, measure. And then all these tubes um, are opened and closed at different depths to capture the water um, at those depths. Now, in the past, we were looking for isotopes that would indicate there was a, um, a warm water or any kind of a, a, a mixing of the water below the surface with the water um, on the surface. This time, however, we used it for genetics. And so the, the recovery was, was a lot more stringent. And I'll, I'll go into that a little bit more. But basically, these deployments allow us to, to actually track water, uh, what, what the chemistry is in that water. And in, you can actually use it to figure out, like, say you have an unknown vent, and you're collecting the water um, at a depth that's halfway between the surface and the depth. Well, you can figure out by the current and the direction of the current, uh, uh, the approximate direction that you need to go to look for that particular vent. But fundamentally, it's, it's used to capture water samples at different depths. And the deployment, so, there, so this is done by the, the um, um, Thompson's crew. The, uh, the deployment is with a crane that goes over the side and it takes at, at, at the 1600 meter uh, or kilometer depth, it takes, uh, or excuse me, what did I say, meter? Yeah, uh, it takes about uh, an hour and a half. So it's, it's, a, it's a time thing. You can see that it's pretty smooth. The water conditions, on, when I took these picture, were in pretty good shape. Now, once we bring it up, there's a team of three of us that would work um, gathering the sampling, uh, the genetic material from the, from the uh, CTD sampling. Um, specifically, what we're looking at uh, is creating this um, in a sterile environment so it can go back to the lab in Washington and they can look at it and look, for example, they can see from the, from the genes or, the, or, the, or even the genetic material, whether it's a prokaryote like a bacteria or archaea, um, because they can look at the, for example, archaea has three different RNA polymerases like eukaryotes, where bacteria only has one, which is which is why it's, it was actually one of those things that was kind of a surprise to me when I started looking into the differences between uh, the bacteria and the archaea. Um, fundamentally, once again, this is looking at a way that possibly um, the biology is interacting with the geology of the uh, seamount. So we, we used other instruments as well. Um, this was an, an elevator. And if you look, um, the elevator, is, is this piece right here. Can you see my mouse when I put it on the screen? Okay, good. I'm not sure if I'm pointing. So that, that is actually the syntactic foam. Now that foam is the same stuff that's actually put into the, the JSON and the, and the um, Sentry. Uh, it it, it pr provides its uh, with bu buoyancy. Um, the, the glass balls and yellow, and, and then if you looked, well, let me see, I don't know if you can see it. Oh, you won't see it in this picture. You'll see it in the next one. But you'll see we normally have these glass balls that are in a, um, uh, a hard hat. 
which are basically used for the buoyancy. The reason the, synt the uh, syntactic foam is really important is because it doesn't really uh, compress um, under pressure. If we put any other kind of foam down there, it would, it would squish. So they, they build the syntactic, the syntactic foam into both the ROV and the AUV uh, in its shape form. So it, it, it basically provides that added buoyancy. Now, bottom pressure recording deployment is what we did most of the time. The bottom pressure recording deployment, does anyone have an idea why we care about bottom pressure when we're, we're putting an instrument on the bottom of, the, of a volcano? So when the volcano is inflating, in other words, when the magma is moving in, the, the volcano will actually swell. It will, ex it, it will expand. Th what that does to the water pressure is reduce the water pressure because it's literally moving closer to the surface. So by really accurately measuring the change in the bottom pressure, pressure you can tell where the magma is moving underneath. So we can use different instruments. In previous voyages, we use hydrophones to listen for the magma that's moving through the bottom, uh, also to hear earthquakes. But in this case, we are actually physically measuring the difference in the bottom pressure. Um, after an eruption, obviously what happens is the bottom pressure is, uh, after the eruption, the, uh, the uh, surface of the caldera falls, which means that the bottom pressure recorder registers an increased amount of pressure. So that's the kind of instruments that we put also on the OOI, the, the Ocean Observing Initiative, at those nodes that can measure that kind of um, bottom pressure in very, very accurate ways. Um, this is what I was talking about before. This is, the, this is part of the uh, bottom pressure deployment and these, these yellow uh, um, Glass, well, they're, they're glass balls inside of these hard hats. Um, this is also the time that um, I got to practice the one thing that I really had fun doing other than doing science, which I brought along hand lines for tuna. And um, when we were basically circling to, to confirm the deployment, so we have location of it, we'd only be going five knots. If you're fishing for tuna, you want to be going around five knots. If you go any faster, which basically the Thompson's going anywhere between 12 or more knots when it's moving from location to location. So the fishing wasn't very good. Every time I, I, I put, brought along a, a couple of hand lines and um, I was only able to fish three times and I brought in an albacore each time. I, I cleaned it up, took it over to the chef. The chef called me a fish whisperer and I thought that was a heck of a nice compliment until I came home and I went fishing five times for Chinook and got skunked, didn't catch a fish. So I guess I have to be offshore to be able to be successful catching fish sometimes. Um, when, we go to record, when we go to recover these, these, these balls flow to the surface. We know where they are, we send a signal down, it opens up an acoustic release. So the, the, the instrument and the uh, hard hats flow to the surface, but they're not exactly where we think they are. So the picture on the left is a picture from the bridge and that's where we go up to actually locate the, the, the floating, um, um, uh, the, yeah, the, the hard hats, the floating balls there. Um, and we have a contest about that too, you know, whoever locates the most, you know. Long story short, I didn't win that contest either. <laughs> um, now the other instruments that we deployed, this is a, 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 a very accurate seismometer. The instruments here, there's a, the big long yellow one is like the batteries. And then there's a thing called a tilt meter, which basically uh, measures the angle uh, that this is moving, meaning if it's going uh, north or south or east or west. The, sim the simplest way to describe it is it kind of measures the squishiness in the, in the crust. So the crust doesn't, you know, the crust doesn't behave uniformly. And so this, by having these seismometers in different locations, and, um, and then we have these landmarks down below that have been sitting there now for over 20 years. And so we tend to put those seismometers at those same locations. So we can actually figure out how rapidly the change is occurring in different locations within the caldera. And this is just um, showing how it gets deployed. It, so it's laid out in a long line. Basically the instrument package, it, there's a weight, there's an instrument package, and then there's uh, a float. We also then had to put down a shield on top of it to protect it from um, current and fish bumps. So that's another job that the Jason had to do. We'd be, we'd be um, 
in the control room, they will deploy the uh, uh, bottom, excuse me, the, the sensor and then the seismometer. And then we would um, be in there and they, we'd watch them, you know, with cameras, watch them deploy the shield. And then as they, as, as it came to the bottom, we would pick up the shield and move it over and, and put it on top of the seismometer. So that was part of the other reasons that Jason was there. Uh, Jason also allowed us to collect water samples. So not only did we get them from the CTD, but we got them from uh, the biological, we had both um, uh, small bottles and large bottles that we used. And, and these bottles actually ended up collecting a bunch of biological samples as well. They went on to Washington for identification. Uh, limpets are on the right side, brittle stars are on the left side. Um, we also found uh, some tube worms growing off of these um, uh, instruments that were deployed two years ago, which kind of gives you an idea of how rapidly these uh, tube worms can actually settle and then grow. And it's, it is very quickly. We, we saw on the lines these, this hydroid, and I don't know what kind of hydroid this is, but there were a lot of them, and they're real pretty. Um, but they were on, the, they, they were basically on any structure that was vertical and floating in the underwater current. You didn't really see them on the bottom as much as up in the current. Um, so a flat, a fat headed sculpin. This was kind of, you didn't see uh, many of these, you didn't see many fish. You, you, you did see, um, oh, what was the most common fish down there? Um, I may not show you a picture of it, it like a rat tail. Um, and they were, they were fairly common. The thing that was really, really startling to me were these blue ciliates. Now this was only at one site and these are blue mats. They're basically a sessile colonial uh, ciliate um, and they create this dense, bright blue carpet in certain Santa Fuca uh, vent fields and at vents elsewhere. Now, these are even more extraordinary because um, we have images from the same site. You see where that, that uh, you see where this triangle is, this thing right here? That's one of those markers I was telling you about, that there's a base here that's been down there now for, well, for three eruptions. And during one of the eruptions, this got encased. It actually came over and covered up all the blue ciliates. And yet the blue ciliates all came back. So even after, uh, you know, hot lava comes over them, they still managed to recolonize the same location that they were, they were colonizing before. And I only saw these blue ciliates in this, in this one place. Um, and then I've got a bunch of scientific stuff here you probably don't care about. But basically, if you're interested in more about this, I have an article and I can, I can definitely share that with you if, if you want to know more details. Some of the other more interesting things, the deep sea cucumber, that's this guy right here. It's kind of cool. Um, on, um, now moving on the surface, part of the time that I was there, now I'm not sure how this is going to work, but I'm going to give it a shot. Um, when I was fishing, so you can see it's not too rough, and it, it's the, the picture sideways, but it's going to, you'll see why, because when, when the dolphins, there we go, when the dolphins come up, now I'm on the stern, I'm on the, the port side of the vessel on the stern, and these guys are just playing. They're so much fun to watch. Um, there was probably, oh, 15 of them or so, and they hung around for about 10 minutes, and there was really no reason for them to hang around. They were just basically hanging there. I thought perhaps um, when the ship stays in one place, it casts a shadow, and that will cause a lot of smaller fish to be attracted to it. So I thought maybe it had something to do with that, but we were moving. So it really wasn't bad. I'm not sure exactly, other than the fact that they seemed to like to, to go along for the free ride, but they were on the bow, where normally you see them on the bow going along with the bow waves. So I'm not really sure about why they were on the stern, but it was kind of nice. It's a nice day. We'll go back to the next one here. I didn't see that many, um, marine mammals or birds. And I'm gonna to talk to you more about birds in a minute, but the, um, normally when, I'm, when, I'm, when I go offshore, I see a lot more different kinds of whales and stuff. And we basically had, we were in the smoke for about five days, maybe six days where the visibility was really poor. And that might've been one of the reasons why we didn't see much, but we did, we did see a fin whale. Um, I thought this is a video. Oh yeah, it is. That's its blow. And it, it only hung around for a little while. So I didn't get much on it. Got a couple pictures. But you can see the blow. You can see the fin. 
the the oddest thing that showed up, and this is part of the one you go to sea often, um, you'll get a, a bird that has blown offshore because it's been stormy and because of the clouds. We were getting birds all the time. I mean, at least one a day. So we were setting out bowls to let to, to give them some water. But for the most part, you're 250, 260 miles offshore. I'm not sure the birds made it back, right? Well, one bird did. This was a short-eared owl. This is the, the owl right here. It came in and I saw it come up it was only flying maybe two feet off the ocean. It was right on the ocean. And then it came over and it got on the port side um, lifeboat and it climbed in the lifeboat. So it was up on the mid deck. And so we thought, well, it's gonna hide up there. Well, what it ended up doing was it, this is the bow <laughs> and it ended up uh, establishing a perch up there. And the last week we were at sea. And then every time one of those little birds showed up, guess what happened? They were surprised by the short-eared owl. So what you see in this right picture, this is this is what he was eating for dinner. So basically, what's happening? I can just imagine this poor little passerine comes in, you know. Oh, good, I can land. And then what happens? Big old owl swoops down and takes care of him. But on the other hand, the owl was pretty darn smart because he was getting fed every day. So he hung and he just became very acclimated. Um, he did not um, did not fly away uh, until we got close to shore. The last day I was there. Um, it, we left at night and um, the uh, owl was there. And when I got up in the morning, the owl had left. So I'm pretty sure it just basically decided it was going to, um, you know, take advantage of a situation, a floating platform that had home delivery. Worked out really well for it. Um, just to give you an idea that this, this is typically what we were seeing about a third of the time we were at shore. And obviously we had some real, really pretty sunsets as well. So it was a really good voyage. Um, the plan is to go back again in about two years. Uh, I'm hoping I'll be able to go along as well. The idea is, is that with the COVID, most of the, the, the ship traffic that NOAA has been doing has been curtailed. So they've been, they've been um, evaluating which trips to do. This kind of trip is one that's really practical because if we had had, so for example, if there was somebody that was asymptomatic that had showed up on ship, and then infected everybody on the ship and somebody had to be uh, airlifted off, that would have been possible at 250 miles. But in a lot of the other voyages that we've been doing, you know, if you go that any further offshore, you're not going to have the Coast Guard being able to come and rescue you. So they're prioritizing their, their, um, their trips for the proximity for rescue, just in case there is this idea of an outbreak on the, on the vessel and they have to, you know, emerge, have an emergency and bring people out. Um, I'm hoping next April, May, uh, to go out with Brian Wells on the uh, California current trip. And that one, we just, we haul nets and we're basically using the information to talk about or to uh, make um, some sort of, have some insight about what the next population of, of salmon and rockfish is gonna look like by looking at the small fish that are out in the California current. And that's about it. So I'm open for questions if you have any. Ah, silence is golden. So, yeah. That um, wave glider uh, built, did that have like a solar panel on top of that as well? It did. And so, see, that's the other aspect of it. It, it when, when you deploy that, you can leave it off, offshore for, for uh, I mean, you know, deployed for five days or even a week, and it has its own power. And, and that way you can relay information as, as, you, as you see something with your cameras, and you want to go back or you want to look at it, that's how you communicate. You can basically use the wave glider to send the signal from the Iridium phone down to the, um, um, the sentry. Cool. So we didn't have any questions in the chat box, but if people want to ask questions, you can just unmute and ask them. Um, I was curious, Bill, um, about those ciliate mats. I can do you can you tell us more? Is what is exactly is a ciliate? I guess is well, um, I can if I can pronounce these words. I actually have it in my notes, um, and it says um, these are. Um, or, or they can you help me with this? Uh, uh, F O L L I C U L I N I N D, folium, folicornid ciliates. I had not heard of those before. 
And I just got, I got an article about him and I read about him, but um, they, they secrete and dwell in tubes and uh, they're colonized by both, they're also colonized by uh, symbiotic bacteria like structures and um, functionally they're their own little ecosystem right there. Is that what gives them the blue color? I'm not sure what gives them the blue, the blue color. It is, it, well, actually, what the literature said is a possible, oops, the possible, in, uh, the possible um, endosymbiotic relationship between these ciliates and the bacteria at the hydrothermal vents is what's giving them the blue color, but it doesn't yeah. say how. Right, so, but it's maybe springing from the bacterium. Hmm. Yeah, it sounds, it's, it, it may be, or it may be providing, places for the bacteria to live, you know, so it, it, it isn't, it's, 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 it's an obligatory uh, symbiosis. No, I meant in terms of the color might be coming from the bacteria. It, it definitely could be. I don't know. You know, it, it's very interesting because it's just start. I mean, it's striking and yet I don't see any real ecological reason for it per se, but yeah. um, you know, cause it's way below any depth for photosynthesis. Well, and for blue light to penetrate too. Yeah. yeah. Well, primarily down there, they use chemosynthesis anyway, but yeah, so that's really right. interesting for the blue color though. Yeah. Phenomenal. Well, what I'll do is um, I can, I'll, I'll post a reference for this. Yeah. I have a, a real good paper on it. And um, if you're interested in, in reading it, we'll, we'll do that through name and we'll just, just post it or I'll give it to somebody who knows what they're doing and they can post it for me. Great. How long were you guys out on the boat doing these observations and, and um, taking the samples? Yeah, we left um, the, I was on board from August 29th until September 20, 20th or 21st. It was a 12 hour trip pretty much from Newport to Axial. Um, and we were, we, when we got on board, it took us about a day to get everything all organized and before we left. So we slept on board one night and then we, then we took off. And then, um, we basically, even though the weather was, the weather was bad in two different times. And so we weren't able to, we weren't able to, we could do the CTD cast, but we weren't able to deploy the Jason or the Accenture at that, during that time. But because we basically, were, um, did all the objectives. I mean, everybody had, you know, primary, secondary, and tertiary objectives for their proposals. We also were working with scientists that were here on shore. So part of the reason I got to go along was because people didn't want to go through the, the um, um, quarantine stuff. And so what we ended up doing was um, using, um, basically um, getting real-time information to the people that were on, on shore still, and we would recover and deploy their instruments. If they wanted, we give them a choice like, is this a good spot? Do you want us to move it? That kind of a thing in real time, which is really kind of cool. So Bill, where's the Tommy Thompson right now? And number two, you mentioned the genetics. What were they looking for and who's looking at it? Yeah, I, now if you want to know where the Tommy Thompson is right now, you just go to your own website because Washington will tell us. But um, I, they do have a plan to go to Puerto Rico later in the spring, but I don't know what they're, uh, what they're doing right now. Mm -hmm. And then um, what they were looking for <coughs> were segments of, of, now I don't know exactly, but what, the way it was explained to me was that they're looking for segments of genetic material of archaea and of other things that they can identify that would give them an indication of what kind of biological activity is, is taking place in that proximity and in that depth. And as you probably know, or you know, as, as they do, as you go up and as you go down, they can kind of calculate the current speed and direction and, and kind of backtrace it to the origin. Neat. So is that environmental DNA they're looking at? I'm yes, thinking. that's environmental DNA they're looking at. It, it, it's basically, uh, I mean, you know, I wouldn't be able to see it with a microscope. This is the kind of thing that you have to do, you know, PCR with. And um, or or some other kind of genetic analysis. Hey, Bill, we got a question here from Kay, um, whose internet is cutting out on her. Uh, she wanted to ask if there were any symbiosis with the cyanobacteria. One question. The second question was, how did Woods, Woods Hole bring Jason over? 
Oh, I don't know the answer to the first question. Uh, the answer to the second question is really interesting. You know, I, I told you how expensive it was. Um, you know, it's like 25,000 a day or something to keep the ship at sea. Woods Hole had to pay, they chartered a plane and they brought their people over. It was, and they were calculating, and this is how much COVID is costing research because all of a sudden you have to figure out, not only do you have to get your people to the ship, but you have to put them in quarantine for two weeks. Now, if you put them in quarantine at, at home and then fly them there in their own chartered airplane, it was cheaper. And so that's what they ended up doing. And they, they shipped the other stuff um, you know, over land, and I, I guess by truck, I'm not sure. Everything looked like it came from like a container, about the same size as the containers you see on railroads, you know? Right, right. Huh. Anyone else have questions? Well, thank you for your attention. And um, it was nice seeing some of your faces and hopefully um, this recording, this has been recorded, and so hopefully we'll, we can post it and then share it with other folks that didn't have a chance to see it um, right now. Hey, that's great. Yeah, um, we'll, uh, I'll, I'll get it on the Facebook page right away, and then <coughs> I'll, I'll get it to Jen, and uh, she can post on the, uh, the name website. Woody's on next week? Uh, next month. Uh, Joe and I will be next talking month. January 11th. January 11th will be our talk. Yeah. yeah. So then BC, tag yeah. it for February. We have, we have two, I have two people who have said that they would. We got the February one. I have Kay doing February. Kay's doing oh, February. Well, I think for March, at, um, two people, they can be spread out, however, but I'm just waiting for the actual um, title yeah. of their talk and when's the best month for them to do it. <laughs> It would be really nice if we could go ahead and get this on our calendar that we have online also um, so that people can see that we're starting to populate our calendar. Yeah. Which calendar? The name calendar? Yeah. yeah. The name Google calendar. The, yeah. the other event that I was going to ask about Washington was uh, how's the Orca Bowl going? Um, we're still looking for more volunteers for the Salmon Bowl. That's a question for Miley who's, who's on. I Miley's think. on. Hi, guys. <laughs> Hi. Winter Wonderland, way to go, Miley. Yeah, I would rather be in a tropical winter wonderland, but uh. my background for today. Um, yeah, Orca Bowl is on and we are, I, we'll see. Um, I'm less worried about volunteers and more worried about how many teens I'm actually gonna get to be able to commit, but people are interested. I mean, I think they're stuck behind their computers. So um, it'll be interesting. Bill, what's the, what's the story down there? Well, I'm only involved on the peripheral, um, but the bottom line was is that um, I'm going to be volunteering and it's going to be done kind of like what we're